hello hello we are a bit early today so I got some business I need to take care of later a little bit better okay um we're going to continue in the 12 powers of man in the chapter called understanding and it begins reference to the dictionary shows the word wisdom understanding knowledge and intelligence to be so closely related that their definitions overlap in a most confusing way hey how you doing i'm early today <laughs> um they overlap in a most confusing way the words differ in a meaning in meaning but various writers on the mind and its faculties have given definitions of these words in terms that directly oppose the definitions of other writers. There are two schools of writers on the metaphysical subjects. Forgot to do the do not disturb. All right, back in business. Uh, there are two schools of writers on metaphysical subjects and their definitions are likely to confuse a student unless he knows to which class the writer belongs. First are those who handle the mind and its faculties from an intellectual standpoint. Among them who may be mentioned Kant, Hegel, Mill, Schopenhauer, and Sir William Hamilton. The other school includes all the great company of religious authors who have discerned that spirit and soul are the causing factors of the mind. Compilers of dictionaries have consulted the former class for their definitions, and we have, in consequence, an inadequate set of terms to express the deep things of the mind. Even Christian metaphysicians who belong in the second classification have no clear understanding of the two great realms of mind. First, that in which pure ideas and pure logic rule. And second, the realm in which the thoughts and the actions of the mind are concerned with reason and the relation of ideas in the outer world. It is only in the last half century that large numbers of Christians have discerned that Jesus taught a metaphysical science. Poets are natural mystics and metaphysicians, and in their writings, we find the safest definitions of the names used to represent the actions of the mind. Poets nearly always make the proper distinction between wisdom and understanding. Tennyson says, knowledge comes, but wisdom lingers. Spiritual discernment always places wisdom above the other faculties of mind and reveals that knowledge and intelligence are auxiliary to understanding. Intellectual understanding comes first in the soul's development. Then a deeper understanding of principles follow until the whole man ripens into wisdom. Here's a quote. Tis the sunset of life gives me metaphysical lore and coming events cast their shadows before. The writings of the Hebrew prophets are good examples of original inspiration, which is wisdom. Solomon was famous for his wisdom. Jehovah appeared to him in a dream and said, ask what I shall give thee. Solomon replied, give thy servant, therefore, an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and evil. Pleased Solomon had asked for wisdom instead of riches and honor. The Lord said, behold, I have done according to thy word. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart. 
and I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. It was, it was after this occurrence that two women appealed to Solomon to decide which of them really was the mother of the child that they both claimed. And the king said, fetch me a sword. And the king said, divide the living child in two and give half to the one and half to the other. Then spake the woman whose living child was unto the king, for her heart yearned over her son. And she said, O oh my Lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay, slay it. But the other said, It shall be neither mine nor thine, divide it. Then the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged. And they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do justice. Okay. The foregoing is a fine example of intuitive knowing. Instead of indulging in the usual taking of testimony and the various methods of proving the case by witnesses, Solomon appealed directly to the heart and got to the truth quickly. No amount of exoteric testimony would have accomplished what the appeal in love brought forth at once. Although it is sometimes difficult to determine between pure knowing and the quick perception of the intellect, intellect the decision can always be made truly based on the presence of the affectional nature. Great philosophers in every age have testified to the activity of a supermind quality, which they have variously named. Socrates had it. He called it his daemon. Plato named it pure reason. Jesus called it the kingdom of the heavens. In an article by M.K. Weishart, printed in the American Magazine for June 1930, entitled, A Close Look at the World's Greatest Thinker, Professor Albert Einstein is quoted as saying, Every man knows that in his work he does best and accomplishes most when he has attained a proficiency that enables him to work intuitively. That is, there are things which we come to know so well that we do not know how we know them. So it seems to me in matters of principle. Perhaps we live best and do things best when we are not too conscious of how and why we do them. We spoke of the great extent to which intuition figures in his work. Sorry, this is a continued quote. He spoke of the great extent to which intuition figures in his work and gave me to understand that the ability to work by intuition is one that can be acquired in any walk of life. It comes as the result of prolonged effort and reflection and application and failures and trying again. Then in the end, one knows things without knowing how one knows them. And I gathered that the professor meant to say that no man knows anything until he knows it in his thorough, instinctive way. People frequently ask Professor Einstein whether as a scientist he believes in God. Usually, he says, I do not believe in a God who maliciously or arbitrarily interferes in the personal affairs of mankind. My religion consists of a humble admiration for the vast power which manifests itself in that small part of the universe which our poor weak minds can grasp, 
Boy, that's deep. <laughs> I like that. Hmm. Continuing in a discussion when the professor is impressed by the correctness of his own views or those of another, he will suddenly exclaim, yes, so it is. It is just, it must be so. I am quite sure that God could not have made it different. For him, God is as valid as a scientific argument. And really there is no separation between the two. You know. Continuing another quote, at one time after prolonged concentration upon a single problem, it lasted for nearly four years, the professor suffered a complete physical collapse. With it came severe stomach trouble. A celebrated specialist said, you must not get out of bed. You cannot stand on your feet for a long time to come. Is this the will of God? queried the professor instantly. I think not. The voice of God is from within us. Something within me tells me that every day I must get up at least once. I must go to the piano and play. The rest of the day I will spend in bed. This I am prepared to accept as the will of God. And with the will of God, as set forth by Einstein, the specialist had to be content. Every day the professor got up, put his bathrobe over his nightshirt, and went to the piano to play. I asked many questions to elicit the lessons of his experience that might be of most use to the rest of us. I learned that he reads little. Much reading after a certain age, he says, diverts the mind from its creative pursuits. Any man who reads too much and uses his own brain too little falls into lazy habits of thinking, just as the man who spends too much time in the theaters is apt to be content with living vicariously instead of living his own life. Gems once again. Alrighty. I have only two rules, which I regard as principles of conduct. The first is have no rules. The second is be independent of the opinion of others. So we find that there is in man a knowing capacity transcending intellectual knowledge. Nearly everyone has at some time touched this hidden wisdom and has been more or less astonished at its revelations. It certainly is a most startling experience to find ourselves giving forth logical thoughts and words without preparation or forethought. Because we nearly always arrive at our conclusions through a process of reasoning. However, the reasoning process is often so swift that we are likely to think that it is true inspiration, especially when we have received either the reflected uplift of other wise ones. Let me read that again. <laughs> However, the reasoning process is often so swift that we are likely to think that it is true inspiration, especially when we have received either the reflected uplift of other wise ones or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This quickening of the intellect is the John the Baptist or intellectual illumination that precedes the awakening of the ideal, the Christ understanding. Some truth students become so enamored of the revelations that they receive through the head that they fail to go on to the unfoldment of the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit and in fire. The Old Testament writers had a certain understanding of the first and the second opening of the mind to spiritual truth. Isaiah said, 
the voice of the one that crieth, Prepare ye in the wilderness the way of Jehovah, make level in the desert a highway for our God. Elijah had intellectual illumination, and the Israelites were taught that he would come again as a forerunner of the Messiah. Jesus said that Elijah had come again in the personality of John the Baptist. I say unto you that Elijah is come already, and they knew him not. Then understood the disciples that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. The history of the Israelites is a sort of moving picture of man's soul and body development. When we understand the psychology of the different scenes, we know what we have passed through or will pass through in our journey from sense to spirit. Intellectual understanding of truth is, as given in the first baptism, is a tremendous step in advance of sense consciousness. And its possession brings a temptation to use for selfish ends the wisdom and the power thereby revealed. When Jesus received his baptism, he, he was led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil or personal ego. Before he could take the next degree in son of God consciousness. But Jesus knew that the illumination of the personal is not the fulfillment of the law and he rejected every temptation to use his understanding for selfish ends. Unless the disciple is very meek, he will find the mortal ego strongly asserting its arguments for the application of the power of spirit to personal needs. The God Mammon is bidding high for men that have received the baptism of spirit and many sell out but their end is dust and ashes. No man can serve two masters, and one cannot serve both God and Mammon. You can't serve God and serve your ego in the pursuit of material goods in this life. Continuing, when we discover in ourselves a flow of thought that seems to have been evolved independently of the reasoning process, we are often puzzled about its origin and its safety as a guide. In its beginnings, this seemingly strange source of knowledge is often turned aside as a daydream. Again, it seems a distant voice an echo of something that we have heard and forgotten. One should have, sorry, one should give attention to this unusual and usually faint whispering of spirit in man. It is not of the intellect and it does not originate in the skull. It is the development in man of a greater capacity to know himself and to understand the purpose of creation. The Bible gives many examples of the awakening of his brain of the heart. Sorry, this brain of the heart in seers, in lawgivers, and in prophets. Let me read that one more time. The Bible gives many examples of the awakening of this brain of the heart in seers, in lawgivers and in prophets. It is accredited as coming from the heart. The nature of the process is not explained. One who is in the devotional stage of unfoldment need not know all the complex movements of the mind in order to get the message of the Lord. It is enough to know that the understanding is opened in both head and heart when man gives himself wholly to the Lord. 
This revelation of head and heart is illustrated in the lives of John the Baptist and Jesus. They were cousins. The understanding of the head bears a close relation to the wisdom of the heart. They both received the baptism of spirit, John preceding Jesus and baptizing him. Here the natural order of spiritual illumination is illustrated. Man receives first an intellectual understanding of truth, which he transmits to his heart, where love is awakened. The Lord reveals to him that the faculty of love is the greatest of all the powers of man and that head knowledge must decrease as heart understanding increases. That is, um, that reads to me like understanding the spirit and the letter of the law and balancing them accordingly. Okay, let's keep going. However, we should remember that none of the faculties is eliminated in the regeneration. Among the apostles of Jesus, Thomas typifies the head, representing reason and intellectual perception. Jesus did not ignore Thomas's demand for physical evidence of his identity, but he respected it. He, con he convinced Thomas by corporal evidence that there had been a body resurrection that he was living, not in a physical or ghost body, but in the same body that had been crucified. Jesus plainly taught that he had attained control of the life in the body and could take it up or lay it down. We may construe the death and the resurrection of Jesus in various ways, many of them fanciful and allegorically far removed from practical life. But the fact remains that there is good historical evidence of the physical reality of the resurrection in its minutest detail. Spiritual understanding shows us that the resurrection of the body from death is not to be confined to Jesus, but is for all men who comprehend truth and apply it as Jesus applied it. He had the consciousness of the new flood of life that comes to all who open their minds and their bodies to the living word of God. And he knew that it would raise the atomic vibration of his organism above the disintegrating thought currents of the earth and thus would save his flesh from corruption. When Jesus told the Jews what he discerned, they said that he was crazy, half a demon, one who teaches and practices the higher understanding and reality of man's relation to the creative law is not sane from the viewpoint of mortal man. When the higher understanding in Jesus proclaimed, verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my word, he shall never see death. They took up stones to cast at him. This startling claim of the power of the word of truth to save one from death is beyond all human reason. And it is resented by the material thoughts, which are as hard rocks. Once again, having a understanding of the spirit of the law versus what you can read literally of the law. Okay. Jesus did not let the limiting, let the limited race thought about man keep him from doing the works of spirit. He knew that the light of truth had arisen and his consciousness and he was not afraid 
in his consciousness, sorry. He knew that the light of truth had arisen in his consciousness and he was not afraid to affirm it. He went right ahead healing the sick and teaching the truth he, as he saw it. Regardless of the traditions of the Hebrew fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He kept the light shining in his consciousness by being loyal to it and by making for himself the highest statements of truth that he could conceive. The Christ mind speaking in him said, I am the light of the world. Spiritual understanding is developed in a multitude of ways. No two persons have exactly the same experience. One may be a Saul, to whom the light comes in a blinding flash, while another, the light may come gently and harmoniously. The sudden breaking forth of the light indicates the existence of stored up reservoirs of spiritual experience gained from previous lives. Hmm. I just got an image of the Kundalini rising when we're having this breakthrough that there's an opening and you know a rising of the consciousness. Wowzers. <laughs> oh, this is fun. Okay. <laughs> Jesus saw that Saul had a spiritual capacity that turned into right channels, would do good. So he took some pains to awaken in Saul the true light and thereby restrain the destructive zeal that possessed him. Here's a quote. He is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. The spiritual nature develops in man as the other attributes of his character develop. As he thinketh within himself, so is he, is a statement of the law that has no exception. We're really limited by the limitations that we place on, on ourselves mentally and otherwise. Man develops the capacity to do that which he sets out to do. If one makes one start, sorry, if one makes no start, one never goes. In idle wishes, fools supinely stay. Therefore, sorry, be there a will, then wisdom finds a way. When there's a will, there's a way. No one ever attained spiritual consciousness without striving for it. The first step is to ask, and here's a quote, ask and it shall be given you, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. Prayer is one form of asking, seeking and knocking. Then make your mind receptive to the higher understanding through silent meditations and affirmations of truth. The earnest desire to understand spiritual things will open the way and revelation within and without will follow. In Daniel 10, 12, it is written, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set the heart to understand, and to humble thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words, for thy words sake. So in other words, if you leave yourself open to receiving answers of a different kind, more inspired answers, as some may say, then you open up consciously the opportunity to receive different understandings and expanded understandings something taught in a way different than what something given in a way different than what you were taught okay it's important to be receptive 
Let me keep going. Daniel humbled himself in the presence of the universal mind and thereby opened his understanding and made himself receptive to the cosmic consciousness. Daniel and his companions were superior in wisdom and understanding to all the native magicians and seers in the whole Babylonian realm. The scriptures say that God gave Daniel knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. That was the quote. Cultivate purity of mind and body, and you will open the way for the higher thoughts, as did Daniel. Mm. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to say it. Um, I had a picture of people being spiritually receptive and spiritually driven to how they live their life interacting with others, you know, in how they des decide what their aims will be versus a different way of doing things, which is focusing on what you can see materially and grasping and pulling and stepping over other people, stepping on other people to get what it is you want materially in this life. It's two different perspectives on how to do things. Because of current events, I um, I made a video on my other channel and basically because of the massacres that keep happening, um, I said that we need to expand energetically our unconditional love to all the people that we have in our sphere of influence to counteract the mentality, that grasping mentality, that stepping on other people mentality, that overpowering other people physically mentality. Because there's a reason why we're here. You know, if Cain and Abel were the first generation of children and they got into this serious altercation that started the process of murder. There was built in our circumstances two different sides and there's a need to be conscious of both sides and there's a need, uh, a need to make the way more smooth. It's, it's, it's kind of like you need the light to recognize the dark and recognizing the dark, you value the light. So with this, um, with the image that I got of clawing and stepping on other people and, you know, being very focused on the things that we can see, you know, the things that we can touch, the things that we can acquire, it just my way would be to express more unconditional love and to encourage other people to do that because we can't all have this clawing mentality because there's always going to be someone on the bottom and there's always going to be somebody climbing on top of them which is not conducive to harmony anyway Whew, backing up off the soapbox. Oh my gosh. It's hard being here, y'all. <laughs> oh, okay. So Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Cultivate purity of mind and body and you will open the way for the higher thoughts as did Daniel. 
he proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's dainties, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Spiritual understanding is developed in the feminine realm of the soul. There is benefits in recognizing femininity. It has its own way of being strength. This development is pictured in Acts 16 and 14. The quote says, and a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Theatira, one who worshiped God heard us, whose heart the Lord opened. Theatira means burning incense. It represents the intense desire of man for the higher expressions of life. When this inner urge comes forth with power, seller of purple, the Lord opens the heart and he receives the heavenly message like the disciples who said one to another, was not our heart burning within us while he spake to us in the way? while he opens to us the scriptures mind you <laughs> the color purple is the color of one of the upper chakras okay <sighs> the color purple and the burning of incense that's reminds me of what pastor michael taught us about sending our prayers up sending our requests up to to the most high and being expectant that he will give us what we ask for All right, continuing. Wisdom consisteth not in knowing many things, nor even in knowing them thoroughly, but in choosing and in following what conduces the most certainly to our lasting happiness. What conduces the most certainly to our lasting happiness and true glory. This is from Landor. Knowledge dwells in heads replete with thoughts of other men, wisdom in minds attentive to their own. That's from Cowper. Knowledge dwells in heads replete with thoughts of other men and wisdom in minds attentive to their own. She that is knowledge is earthly of the mind, but wisdom heavenly of the soul. That's from Tennyson. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. That high mindedness again from Psalms 51 and 10. For wisdom shall enter into thy heart and knowledge shall be pleasant unto thy soul. And that's Proverbs 2, 10. But the path of the righteous is as the dawning light that shineth more and more onto the perfect day. That's Proverbs 4, 18. A tranquil heart 
is the life of the flesh, but envy is the rottenness of the bones. And that's from Proverbs 14, 30. My son, forgive not my law, but let thy heart keep my commandments. Oh, forgot, forget. My son, forget not my law, but let thy heart keep my commandments. And that's Proverbs 3 and 1. Trust in Jehovah with all thy heart and lean not upon thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy paths. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. For the gaining of it is better than the gaining of silver and the profit thereof than fine gold and the profit thereof of fine gold than fine gold she is more precious than rubies and none of the things thou canst desire art to be compared unto her length of days is in her right hand in her left hand are riches and honor her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is every one that retaineth her. Jehovah by wisdom, by wisdom founded the earth by understanding. He established the heavens. And that's Proverbs 3, verses 13 to 19. And with that, we're going to end this talk today. <laughs> the next chapter is called The Will is the Man. If you are reading along with me, that's where we are going to be talking from next week. Um, oh, my heart is full, y'all. <laughs> This is the stuff they don't teach you in school. <laughs> it takes people outside of academia to write the things that are important. That's just my um my unsolicited opinion. <laughs> but I thank you for joining me. And we will continue next week, Wednesday, right here. Uh, as I said earlier, I started early because I made an appointment for 7.30 so, and I didn't want to miss it because I love the readings from this book. I love doing this channel. Um, and if you haven't visited my other channel, it's Pull Your Power Back on both YouTube and Instagram. You'll see my picture on there. Um, if you got any benefit from this, please follow, subscribe, like, share, share, share. Hit the notification bell. Both YouTube and Instagram have one. And return. I will talk to you soon. Be well. <laughs>